Hi, my name is Jilly Crowsdale. I'm the Associate Director for Healthcare Science at Sandwell and West Birmingham Hospitals NHS Trust. Um, so I'm the lead scientist for the Trust. Um, in this DVD I'd like to show you some of the opportunities that are available to you as um, a career in healthcare science. Um, you might think why would I be interested in a healthcare science career and what is it? Um, your impressions might be that careers in hospitals are really about being doctors and nurses and actually the variety of work that you can be involved in is really, really broad. Um, if you're interested in science, if you're excited about science um, and if you like the idea of using that to care for people or have a positive impact on their well-being, then one of the careers in healthcare science may be the one for you. You may be wondering what radiopharmacy is. Radiopharmacy involves the manufacture of radiopharmaceuticals, which are sterile radioactive medicines. They're used in nuclear medicine to help um, image how well different organs are working. A radiopharmaceutical is a complex made up of what I call a useful molecule, and that's a molecule that gets either stuck in the organ you're looking at or used by the organ you're looking at. And because you've tagged a radioactive tracer onto it, you can actually see what happens to the useful molecule within the body using the gamma camera, which can detect the radiation. So, for example, if you want to see how well someone's kidneys are working, um, your useful molecule is a molecule that just gets eliminated via the kidneys. So you inject it into the patient, it quickly goes all around the body, and then it comes out via the urine. It doesn't get taken up into any different parts of the body. And because you've tagged the radioactive tracer, you can actually watch the useful molecule accumulate in the kidneys and then empty out into the bladder. The process I do, making the complex, has to be done in a sterile environment so that we can make sure that we making things that are safe to inject into patients. So we have to go through a very specific hand washing regime, we have to take off our outdoor clothes, put scrubs on, keep our hair in a mop cap so that we don't end up with hairs and particles in the clean room. Once we've washed our hands, we then go into the changing area and um, put on some sterile, non-shedding clothing. This changing process has to be validated so that you can prove that you're able to change without contaminating the suits with any microorganisms and also without introducing them into the environment. It's important not to allow overshoes, for example, to touch the clean side of the changing area. Once we've changed, we go into a clean room. Um, the clean room is, is supplied with filtered air so that the microorganisms and particles in the environment are extremely low. We make sure that the equipment is kept to a minimum inside the clean room itself. The actual manufacture takes place in a cabinet that is supplied with air that's been filtered even more than the room. We're checking that we've got the right air flows in the cabinet. That has to be documented. All the materials that are used in the cabinet have to be cleaned before they can be put in there. So all our syringes and needles are all sprayed and wiped with meth. Everything that we do, we try and incorporate principles of radiation protection. So we keep the time that we handle things to a minimum. We shield the vials, we shield the syringes. Um, there's a screen, like a little L screen inside the cabinet. And again, that's to shield the operator to keep their exposure down as low as reasonably achievable. It's no higher than, say, if you were to move to Cornwall, because the background radiation in Cornwall is a little bit higher than it is in the West Midlands. You can see that the syringe is put into a syringe shield, again, to keep the radiation exposure to the operator down. And then it's introduced into the kit. For the majority of kits, it's very important that we keep air away from the complex because this can break down the complex. Once the radioactive starter material has been drawn up into the syringe, it's diluted to a suitable volume and then it's added to the radiopharmaceutical kit. Some kits have to be boiled to make sure that the complex is formed. For most of them, it's just a matter of allowing the kit to incubate so that the reaction can take place and then the patient doses can be drawn up. What is technically you know, being done looks quite simple, but actually the chemistry of what's happening inside the kit is quite interesting as the new complex forms. We monitor our hands to make sure that we haven't contaminated ourselves before we go on to make the next product. After being in radio pharmacy for all this time, I'm still never bored and I still never think, is it home time? And do you know, I think that makes me pretty lucky.
Well, at school I had no plans what I wanted to be for the future. Uh, I knew I was always good at maths and physics and academic subjects like that. I'd considered being a pilot or an accountant. My dad wanted me to go into law, um, but I didn't see myself as a lawyer. It wasn't until um, my university days um, where I was introduced to medical physics. I did a, a physics degree and amongst all the boring quantum mechanics and thermal physics and mathematics, there was a module called Physics in Medicine, which I thought I'd give a try. And that really opened my eyes to how physics could be applied to the common good of helping patients. How your knowledge of quantum mechanics and radiation and nuclear physics can be used in a hospital environment. I work in the Physics and Nuclear Medicine Department now at City Hospital Birmingham and we inject radioactive traces into patients. So a knowledge of nuclear physics and how the radiation interacts with the matter and how we get our scans, it's very important. How we get the best quality scan, how we get the best out of our patients, it's all physics. In the Department of Physics and Nuclear Medicine we inject our patients with radioactive traces and these traces go somewhere in the body and we want to see where they go and where we have uptake for diagnostic purposes. So when the patients are injected with these radioactive traces, they, the tracer is giving off gamma radiation. And this radiation is then imaged by a special piece of equipment called a gamma camera. It's similar to an MRI scanner or a CT scanner that you've probably already heard of. Except this scanner is designed to detect the gamma rays coming out of the patient. Shortly I'll show you something called a myocardial perfusion scan. The scan we're looking at here is called a myocardial perfusion scan. Myo means muscle, cardial means the heart, and perfusion means blood supply. So in this scan we're looking at the blood supply to the heart. In nuclear medicine we inject our patients with radioactive traces, and these traces will go somewhere in the body. Uh, this tracer goes to the heart, which is what we want to look at, but it also goes to other organs. This is the heart at the top, these are the kidneys at the back, this is the small bowel at the bottom, and this is the liver. We're not interested in these other organs, we're only interested in the heart. What we'd prefer to do is take slices of the heart, which is what we see in this screen here. These are slices through the heart muscle, going from the tip to the heart, back towards the atria. And this is a normal scan. A normal scan looks like donuts at the top and horseshoes at the bottom. And what we're looking at is whether these horseshoes or donuts have any bites taking out of them. These donuts are perfect circles and the horseshoes are perfect U-shapes. And this is normal. If we compare it to an abnormal scan, we can see that to the right hand side the donut is incomplete. This part of the heart to the right has abnormal blood supply. Now what we have to do is play a game of spot the difference. Is this picture the same as this picture? In this example we can see that the picture at the top is different to the picture at the bottom. The bottom picture looks normal, it is a completed donut. This is important to the cardiologist because if the bottom picture is better than the top picture, they can repair it with surgery. They go through the femoral artery in the groin, they blow up the diseased artery, and they put a wire cage in to resupply that part of the heart with blood. Looking at this screen now, this software attempts to quantify the size of the defect. The software thinks that this part of the heart is abnormal, which is what we saw before from the pictures. And at rest it thinks it's almost normal. The picture at the bottom shows us the difference, this is called the reversibility. And again, if there's no reversibility, there's nothing the surgeons can do about it. We can also take pictures as the heart beats. Here we can see the heart beating and we get important information that we can give to the cardiologists. We can tell them the size of the heart at its largest size, 60 mils here, and the size at the smallest, 19 mils. We can tell them a very important number called the ejection fraction. This is the percentage of blood expelled from the heart each heartbeat. Here it's 69% which is normal. 
This information will go back to the patient's cardiologist and they will decide what to do with it, whether to intervene surgically or whether the patient will benefit from medication. Hello, I'm Jenny Thompson. I'm a trainee clinical technologist in nuclear medicine. Um, in my job, I am responsible for getting patients scanned. Um, so we do pictures, different pictures, depending on what areas of the body we're looking at. Sometimes we're looking at their heart, their brain, their bones, their liver, and just depends on what's wrong with them. We give patients injections and then take pictures later on. So it's just, it's patient care. It's being, making sure that you're doing everything you can for them whilst getting good quality images. Um, I, I didn't grow up dreaming of being a technologist at all. I did my A-levels at school. I did maths and psychology and biology because that was what I liked at the time. I then went on and did a degree in neuroscience and psychology. Again, that was just what I was interested in. At the end of that, I didn't see it throwing me straight into a job. I just applied for any jobs I thought that were going to be useful and um, that I'd enjoy. So it was mainly things science-based, mixing science and people. I found this job, I knew absolutely nothing about it. Had to Google nuclear medicine before an interview. Um, but I actually found that it was really interesting and haven't looked back from there. I enjoyed the mix of seeing patients and also with a bit of a science background. So um, every day you're doing something different. We're doing completely different scans. You're seeing different patients. They've all got a different story. Um, and it's just really nice that I come to work and don't really know what I'm going to see that day. Well, my job actually comes with a degree on the side. So I'm training um, to be a technologist still and doing a BSc in clinical technology. So they've put me through that course. Um, and then from there, I could do extra qualifications if I wanted um, to train in sort of doing paediatric specialism. You can go on and do a slightly different version of nuclear medicine and um, doing pet studies. Um, so various different things, um, loads of research opportunities. I'm doing a project at the minute through college. I'm hoping that that's going to um, be useful for the department. So onwards and upwards, hopefully. My name's Holly, I'm a trainee clinical physiologist at the Neurophysiology Department in City Hospital. The Neurophysiology Department, um, they do tests on the brain and nervous system. Um, so we basically do a few different kinds of tests. Um, we do EEGs, which looks at the brain activity, which is mostly used for uh, diagnosing epilepsy, but can sort of indicate other um, brain disorders as well. We do nerve conduction tests, um, which look at how the nerves are working. EPs, which look at, um, which are sort of a mixture of the two, where we look at the pathways up to the brain. Uh, and we also, as uh, physiologists, we assist the doctors here with um, EMG tests, which is looking at how the muscles are working. I came across it by chance, really. Um, I'd done my degree in psychology. Um, and was just looking online to see if I could find anything where I could use that. Uh, I added my CV onto NHS Direct and just came across it one day. It looked interesting, so I came here for three weeks just to sort of observe and look at what they did. And I found it really interesting, so I applied for it. You had to apply for the course at Wolverhampton Uni and uh, apply for a job as well. So um, I got a few interviews, this was actually my first interview of what was going to be a horrible week of interviews. This was the first one I got it and so I came here. I, think I like the I like the one-on-one -on -one time with the patient because most of the tests are at least half an hour long. You get quite a lot of time to, to talk to patients. Also it's, it's quite a hands-on practical job as well. You learn sort of technical skills and you obviously sort of improve and you get more experience. I've got one year left now, it's a four year course. So after that year I will then apply a job here or elsewhere, depending on you know whether there's jobs available. And then I will be a clinical physiologist. And then from there there are other tests that that we can do here, which I'm not doing at the moment as a trainee. So as you sort of gain experience in other tests, then you sort of move up the banding. Um, 
and sort of eventually getting to senior clinical physiologist. You should be able to do everything that the department does. I certainly didn't plan to do audiology from the start. I, um, at, I remember at school I didn't know what, to, what I wanted to do so I chose the sciences and I did the sciences and then ended up going, I went to university, chose to do biology at university. Um, I remember just being really into uh, primates <laughs> and so I used to choose all the modules that were to do with like monkey behaviours and that sort of thing but then when it came down to it actually getting a job working with monkeys not, it wasn't happening, and so I would just looked through, um, I looked through like a career guide thing, and audiology was right near the start, beginning with A. And um, my mum is deaf as well, so maybe that made me think a bit more about it. And then the more I looked into it, the more intrigued I was, and just uh, went for it. It was that's how it happened. So I'd already done a degree in biology. And then I used that degree then to help me go on to a master's course, and it was a master's in audiology. Um, I did it down in Southampton. Um, and yeah, it was like a year's course in audiology. It was pretty intensive, but it was really good fun as well. There was a really good group of people on there. When I did the course, it was you, you did a year at university, um, and then you, then you got a placement in a hospital, local hospital. and um, so then I was working in the hospital and you're getting paid at the time uh, while you're training. It was good, yeah. In my job as a, as a clinical scientist, I see a full range of different patients. So the patient comes in, um, you sit them down on a chair, make them feel at ease. Um, most important thing to do is have a look in their ear, first of all, make sure the eardrums look healthy and that there's no obstruction in the ear. Wax, obviously. Um, and if everything is clear and there's no significant obstruction, we sit them down, headphones on, they hold a button, and then I'll give them some instructions that you're going to hear a series of sounds. They start quite loud and then get quieter and quieter. Every time you hear the sound, you press the button, and that's how it works. And we t when we test the hearing, we're not just testing it one sound in each ear. It's a range of frequencies, so you can imagine that almost like um, a keys and a piano so I start low tone dung dung and then it's just higher and higher in pitch different tones and then at each pitch the patient may have a hearing loss maybe in the higher frequencies but the low frequencies may still be normal and that's quite a common thing um, and then each patient will have a different configuration of hearing loss and then when we've completed the hearing test we'll discuss the results with the patient decide how we want to move forward um, some patients may be suitable for hearing aid and we now fit digital hearing aids to all patients who require them and the digital hearing aid is it's you could program the settings in the hearing aid to suit an individual patient so they are absolutely excellent devices these days and the technology is just adv advancing all the time so it's a very fast moving career to be in. My name's Vicky Cooper and I'm a cardiac physiologist. Cardiac physiology is an umbrella term really for a number of diagnostic tests that we perform for patients with possible um, coronary artery disease. So we do lots of diagnostic testing from ambulatory heart monitors all the way through to patients that are coming in having a heart attack that will come into this room and have an angioplasty which is a procedure to open up the blockage in the artery of the heart and restore blood flow. And there's a number of tests that we do to get to that point. I started this job um, over 15 years ago. I came into the job um, as an assistant technical officer and I performed a number of diagnostic heart tests and trained in that particular area. And I had a real love for cardiology. Um, I enjoyed the patient contact and helping people and I enjoyed learning all about the heart, which is such a complex organ. Um, and then I went on to um, train further in my job and I did my degree in um, clinical physiology, specialised in cardiology, and I'm here today now as a cardiac physiologist. So a moment ago we saw a patient having a coronary angiogram. He'd come in and had a heart attack, and it's just to talk you through what that actually means. 
if you have a look at this screen here, we've got an x-ray image of the heart. You have to have a little bit of an imagination, but this shadow here is the heart. There's a catheter going down into the vessel and we're injecting a dye into there to look for any narrowings in the heart that could be causing a heart attack. Here we can't actually see anything at all because the vessel is completely blocked. In this case, we've then gone on to put a wire down and then we've injected a contrast agent which will light up the artery for us and here we can see where the blockage begins. Put a wire down the artery here which restores some of the flow and because there's a narrow in there, there's some plaque in the vessel, we need to keep it open with a, a small piece of mesh called a stent, which we'll then go on to do. You can see blood flow is being restored down the vessel, and it just shows how big it actually is. Okay, so now we have the vessel opened back up again now, restoring blood flow as it should be. So we've gone from a completely blocked artery to a healthy open artery and a healthy heart. respiratory physiologist. Respiratory physiology is a branch of human physiology which focuses upon the respiration of the breathing system. Uh, it's a very varied role and we look at how well your breathing works under different circumstances such as when you're exercising, when you're at rest or when you're sleeping. I went to college um, and did my A-levels and the entry requirements for the course were two A-levels with at least one science and the course was a three-year degree with a work placement incorporated. I like that I get to uh, perform my own investigations and collect my own data which I can then analyse and hopefully help to determine a patient's diagnosis. This piece of equipment is called a plethysmograph and it's where we carry out our lung function tests. The first test we carry out is a basic breathing test called spirometry where we analyse the patient's airways for any blockages or narrowing. Evelyn, I'm going to pop this nose peg on your nose and ask you to seal your teeth and lips around the mouthpiece. Yep. I'll ask you to breathe in as deeply as you can. Once your lungs are full, I'll then shout blow and I need you to blow out as fast as possible and keep breathing out until you can't go any further. Okay. Okay, just breathe normally for me to begin with. Okay, now take a large breath all the way in. Right in, right in, and boom! Keep going now, keep going, keep going, keep going until you're empty, you're almost there, you're doing really well, and relax. That's brilliant. Well done, have a rest. The, the level that I'm at at the moment, there's a lot of career progression available to me. Uh, the hospital gives me the opportunity to go on many different courses, and I attend conferences on a yearly basis. I'm Stephanie, I'm a trainee clinical scientist in gastrointestinal physiology. So I went to university and I studied biochemistry and molecular medicine. I knew that I wanted to be involved in healthcare in some way. I wanted to be involved uh, with patients and working with patients. And it was at university where I got an email sent around about this course called the Scientist Training Programme. Uh, it sounded great, you got to work in a hospital while studying still at the same time, you get to do a master's in clinical science. Whilst you're working, uh, you, you're working with patients from day one. It sounded brilliant, so I applied for that and was lucky enough to get accepted. We get sent patients that have problems anywhere along their gastrointestinal tract. It's functional problems, so you can get your, your cancers or ulcers, but we look at problems with the function of the gastrointestinal tract, so that how the muscle action works when you, every, all of your muscles are supposed to pass food and water through nicely and it's supposed to contract in what's called a peristaltic motion. But for a lot of people, that muscle activity doesn't work how it should do and we can do tests on patients. So in the video you can see the practitioner talking to the, to the patient explaining the test. They put some local anaesthetic in the patient's nose to help numb the area and then a tube's passed into the patient's nose, down their food pipe or their esophagus, into their stomach. The tube goes into the nose and not through the mouth down into the stomach because the angle of passing the tube is easier through the nose. It's a wider angle in order for it to go down into the food, food pipe. It'll sit there for about 10 minutes while some measurements are being taken, which you may be able to see on the screen. The measurements are pressures of the esophagus, which in a normal person should 
all be coordinated, the pressures should be higher in places in order to push food down the esophagus into the stomach. But in some patients, the pressures can be really high or really low or not coordinated. And as a result, food might not be passed into their stomach properly or things are coming back up from the stomach into their esophagus, which can cause symptoms like heartburn and indigestion. And so these tests are really useful to diagnose conditions like that. Hello, my name's Emma and I'm a biomedical scientist in histology. Here in histology, we receive tissue samples that we process and analyse to look for certain diseases, mainly cancers. These tissue specimens can be as small as a biopsy or a skin tag that you might have removed at your local GP surgery, or they can be much bigger, such as a colon or um, a kidney that have been removed during an operation in hospital. The specimens we receive are brought to us from various wards within the hospital via porters and also from our local GP surgeries. Once the specimen has been booked in, it gets brought through to what we call the trimming room. Here in the trimming room, either a specialist biomedical scientist or a consultant will come in to dissect the specimens if required. And this means taking um, a large specimen and selecting smaller parts of it to be analysed. Once selected, these get loaded onto a large machine overnight. These machines pump various solutions into the tissue and this prepares the tissue ready for the next step. Once this process is finished, the blocks are removed from the machine and they need to be suspended in molten wax. These blocks are then placed onto a cold plate to solidify the wax, ready for the next stage in the process. Once the tissue has been suspended in the wax, it can be brought through to the main laboratory where the blocks are cut by a scientist on a special machine called a microtome. It's important at this stage that the tissue has been embedded into the wax because otherwise if we tried to take a section on these machines, the tissue would crumple. The microtomes produce very thin sections of the tissue which are floated out onto a hot water bath and picked up on a glass slide. The glass slides are placed into a hot oven to melt the wax, leaving just the tissue on the slide. We can now start the staining process. Various dyes and chemicals are used to differentiate the different cell components within the tissue. Some of these stains are automated, which means they are placed onto a machine, and some are hand stained by biomedical scientists. Once the tissue on the slide has been stained, it needs to be checked under a microscope by a biomedical scientist. The biomedical scientist is looking for a good quality section and to check that the staining has worked. Once we are happy with it all, the slides can go through to a consultant for them to diagnose and report. Once the case has been reported, the result gets fed back to the patient. I've been doing this job for almost seven years now. At school, I did biology and chemistry A-levels, so I've always had an interest in science and I knew that I wanted to work in a laboratory when I was older. I went on to university and I did a biological sciences degree and then started off in this career as a medical laboratory assistant. Once I started working in histology, I knew this was the career I wanted to pursue, so I then decided to do a long distance course in order to convert my degree from biological sciences into biomedical sciences. Alternatively, if I knew that this was something I was going to do, I would probably have gone straight to uni and done biomedical science in the first place. Once I had this degree, I could then go on and do a professional qualification, which led me to become a qualified biomedical scientist. Now, if I want to, I can progress further. There are other professional qualifications that I can do in order to um, move up the career ladder within histology. There's also options to further my knowledge because we have training sessions where we can all get together as a team and discuss interesting cases. And it's nice to be able to learn facts from more senior members of staff who can pass on their knowledge to the rest of us. I enjoy my job because I've always had an interest in science and um, even though we don't interact with patients directly, you do know that there is someone at the end of it and it's nice to feel like we're helping somebody every time you come into work. Hi, I'm Sonia and I'm a biomedical scientist. 
I just I really enjoy um, working here. It, every day is different. No day is the same. Um, we work with a, a vast variety of people, and it's nice that you know that you're making a difference and you're helping people. My job role is to provide blood tests for patients that are um, quite sick, and also um, provide blood for blood transfusions. Um, some people um, need blood transfusions um, to get better. Um, before I started the job, um, when I was doing my GCSEs, I did a bit of um, research, um, like what I wanted to do. Um, I found out that for this course I needed um, five um, GCSE pass grades A to C. Um, so I got that, um, then I went on to do my A levels. Um, and also included a science subject. Um, and also, um, before applying to university, I asked for work experience, and they said they couldn't do work experience. But I came for an afternoon, so I had a look around, and I really liked it, and I thought, this is what I want to do. So I also put that in my personal statement when I applied at universities to say I've been, and this is definitely what I want to do. And I work as a, a biomedical scientist, but there is, there is opportunity to become senior management. Um, depending on your experience and your job role. Um, currently I work with our um, deputy lead on one of the sections in the lab um, and I help him um, so I'm doing a few extra jobs and it's keeping me busy <laughs> so I enjoy that, it's something different. To be honest when I left school I was probably in the same shoes as a lot of 16 year olds now, I had no idea of what I was going to do at all. I had sort of good grades, uh, B's and a few A's, so I thought really I could do whatever I wanted. So actually I, I went to do A levels, uh, maths, physics, computing and um, psychology. And I thought there's this just a range of uh, thingy, um, A levels so I could go on to really what I wanted to do. But then I discovered A levels just wasn't for me at all. So I went on to a, a B tech and then as I said that was when I uh, started to see all the apprenticeships going and um, I thought engineering was the one for me yes. and um, I seen the apprenticeship was going with the hospital and that obviously you now that made me think a bit because I thought it was a really good trust to work for so I just applied for it and then it went on from there. Um, well to be honest uh, the aim was to actually go on to a degree itself because I thought to myself why am I going to be doing a degree and put myself in all that debt when I can join the apprenticeship do a BTEC level 3 onto H&C and then hopefully a degree after which would put me in hardly any debt and I'd be getting paid and have practical experience all at the same time. Being 18 I think and driving well nobody that's 18 and, and, that's, and that's driving and going to college can expect to pay for all these things so really an apprenticeship is a good course because whilst I'm actually learning I'm getting paid so I can actually pay for all the things that I want and I'm actually working full time so I'm actually getting into the routine from young so when I'm actually older I'll have a lot more experience than most people that are going for jobs really. We have a set schedule from 8 to 4 Monday to Thursday and 8 to 12 on Friday and um, regularly our, our manager will come in over a few months and just check how we're doing and we have uh, log books and sort of weekly reports which actually go to our managers so they can actually see how we're doing and our progress. It's actually four years, which is, it seems like a, a long time, but to be honest, four years will go in a snap of your fingers. They say that the place isn't guaranteed, but really, if you actually think about it, why would a company be putting all this time and effort and money into you if they was not going to put you onto the actual job? Well, obviously, if, if you was going to be coming to just mess about and actually not do your job properly, then obviously that would be a consequence, but if you actually come and you actually have a desire for engineering, then really on to six, seven, eight, maybe even 20 years. I'll be looking back and I'll be in the NHS, maybe even a manager, but obviously that's a long way down the line, but hopefully 